world. Our drinks are here. That's magnificent. Is that Weiss beer? That is. Well, here you go. Thank you. Thank you. I am joined today by Harold Haas. I'm so glad you could join us today. I'm so pleased to be here. Well, we have to have a toast to that. So, Harold, I'm really excited because you are, live right now in Edinburgh, Scotland, am I correct? That's so correct, yeah. That is a far place to come all the way here to join us, so I want to thank you for that. That's exciting. So let's talk about you're here because you have done some amazing things in, in both not only as a professor, but now as an innovator in discovering and working on Li-Fi. So I want to really talk about that because you've been doing this for a very long time. This is not something that just happened overnight, no. trying to figure that out. So I would like to talk about how does somebody kind of go on this journey? Talk us, tell us, I guess, help us with the journey that you've been on for the journey of Li-Fi. I think, uh, first of all, th th thank you for, for inviting me, giving uh, the chance to, to, to explain that to you. Um, it is a, a fair bit of luck involved in this as well, uh, the Li-Fi journey. And, um, however, the way it started, so my background is wireless communications. So I've, I'm a hybrid in a sense. I've, I've worked a lot of my time in the industry. I worked for Siemens Communications Mobile in, uh, in Munich, in, in Germany. That's why I like the Bavarian beer. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I, was, I was working in, in, at Siemens to develop a patent portfolio for what is now 4G, so fourth generation of cellular communications. At that time, when we, we had the transition from mobile telephony to mobile multimedia, it was clear to me that, that the bandwidth and the data rates that we need in the future may not be served entirely by the radio spectrum. So that's why... When I got an academic post, I decided to look in alternative ways of uh, providing wireless data to, to us users. And that's why the Li-Fi, and when the Li-Fi journey started in the re year around uh, 2002. And so when you look at that journey, you know, it wasn't just because of that, but what made you personally, you looked at that Li-Fi, but get excited about technology and innovation. This isn't just something you say, I saw the Li-Fi part of it, but you've been wanting to do this since you were a little boy. Your, your father was in, in, in technology. He was involved. You know, you lost your mom at a very young age, and so that was very, I think, tough for you. So you've been very focused on wanting to be innovative and creative, even from the very beginning. I do, yes, and uh, it was that moment when I won, won Christmas uh, Eve, I saw this uh, sort of set of electronics under the tree, and that really excited me. I never really um, went off it and uh, tried to use these different parts in the most creative ways and build circuits that blink and then give sounds and, and, and develop, uh, get, get radio in and so on. And that, that, that piece of taking parts and putting them together in a, in a creative way is something that has been driving me throughout my life, as, as you said. And, um, and with Li-Fi, I mean, I, I, did, I did the same. I recognized the problem, and I tried to find out what are the pieces, the legal pieces, that would help us overcome that problem. And then I found it in Li-Fi. And that's, it, was so, the, it was the luck I mentioned earlier. It could have not worked at all, but we went out of the box and thought, can it work? And, and we had this moment where we had a breakthrough in terms of so is and that so what you think most about is, is the idea of what Li-Fi can do, or you think about what changes you can bring to society with Li-Fi? I think it's more the changes to society. It's, it's really taking technology and, and helping us uh, moving forward in our, in our lives, in our personal lives, and in, in helping humanity get, get better, better solutions. And, and, and technology has helped us. I mean, if, if you look back 100 years back, the, the average sort of... Uh, um, uh, uh, average age of, of humans on the planet were around 40, 50 years, and now it's, 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 it's 18 more. It's because of technology, and we have advanced technology, and we must not forget that the advancements of mankind are primarily pe because of technology, and that's, that's what's driving me in, in the Li-Fi space, in my little niche in, in, in wireless communications. I just want to know, do you ever sleep? I'm just kind of thinking you're kind of a guy that never sleeps. You're always going and going, and your mind's always working. Uh, I sometimes sleep because uh, I need to get the rest in order to get to new ideas, but uh, it, it, it's difficult sometimes. Some, some, some nights are spent by thinking around some problems to solve them. Yes, yeah, so obviously that's, that's the case, yeah. So it's kind of tough. I'm sure your wife says, could you stop tossing and turning? I'd like to have a nice restful night. 
That's uh, that, that. That is a, <laughs> a <laughs> sentence that I hear very often. Yeah, why why are you at a laptop and can you not do something else? Can you not uh, go out or, or so on? So sometimes yeah, we are drawn into these uh, these problems. We want to solve them. We want to move forward. We want to change the world, and that's that's what's been driving us. And uh, you're Sometimes. anxious about it. You, you get excited when you, you think about the life I. So let's talk about it because that's mm. ex interesting. For those who, who want to understand it, let's walk through technically what really is life fi and how it's different from when we hear life fi yeah. mm -hmm. light fidelity, versus when we think about Wi-Fi. Walk us through what it really is. Yeah, uh, very, very brief. So yes, it's, it's sort of wireless communications using light, sort of light that's around us in, in the form of LED light. And basically what we've done is we have enabled LED light not only to illuminate, but also to, to send data at very high speed. So we change the intensity of the light at a very fast rate so that the human eye wouldn't be able to recognize the, the flicker, if you want, but the detectors, which are photo detectors, would recognize the changes in the light intensity, and that changes have data encoded. And we found ways to encode data in a very efficient and, and uh, efficient manner to send very many data per second through these light bulbs, these, these sort of off-the-shelf LED lights. So using lights, but not only using a light to send data to one receiver, to one smartphone, but to send data to multiple receivers, and, and multiple receivers then also send data back in the uplink via infrared light, also a light channel. So we have a bi-directional communication and then also we allow devices to move. So we have like our smartphones, we move through the aisle, we, we move through the corridors, through the rooms, and the connection must not be interrupted. So our Skype session should main, be maintained. So that's why we network these lights and build complete wireless networks by light. And that's the fundamental difference to what has been around for a long time is visible light communication which is primarily the connection between a transmitter and a receiver, which are often very static. But what we do is we build real wireless networks based on lights, and every light bulb is an access point, is a base station, if you want, that is, that is communicating. So it's bringing the cellular radio stations, the radio towers that you see outside and in the streets, bringing these radio towers into our homes, into our luminaires, and use the light as a barrier of, of high-speed data communication. And uh, I mean, we, we've shown in the lab um, with, with uh, four different colors, uh, 15 gigabit per second with a sort of a light source that costs less than a pound. So it's really using these off-the-shelf components to build high-speed wireless networks using, using, using light. Looking at all of this right now, how would you network the Li-Fi as well? That's a very important question because every light bulb acts as an access point and you need to get data to the access point. And there's two principal ways of doing that. One is uh, using a standard that's called power over Ethernet. So connecting the LED light bulb with an Ethernet cable, data cable, would give you sort of power and data. That's the easiest, but that's only for new installations. For retrofits, one would use a technology that's called power line communication. It means basically you get your data into your home and then you have a bridge from that data box into the mains power ring and the mains power supply would be the barrier that, that the channel to send data to the light bulb. So it's, it's, it's that way it will be connected. So use the, the, the electricity ring, basically. Are we talking about a lot of adoptions now, or are we talking about adoptions in a year or two years from now? In that technology, we, we already been coming from Mobile World Congress, where we made a big splash in Pure Li-Fi in releasing the world's first fully integrated Li-Fi modem into a laptop. We had a laptop where Li-Fi basically was, has been used to connect a laptop to a light there. Also, we released an integrated, a fully integrated uh, Li-Fi um, cover, sort of a Li-Fi um, enclosure uh, for a smartphone. Uh, so the, the, the Li-Fi modem was integrated into the cover, and that, that it was the first, the first sort of fully integrated smartphone with the Li-Fi capabilities. So we, we talk about adoption now. It's not, it's not in the future. We are, we are talking about now. And that journey of integration has started. And we will see it then, from that point on, integrated in the future into the smartphone itself, not only in the, in the cover. So we're talking about speeds that are so much faster. Yeah. We're talking about it so much. It's less costly. 
and we're mm -hmm. talking over time that we can do things indoors quicker and move things than we ever th thought we could imagine. Yeah, imagine you have high definition video, we get sort of higher higher compression rates and, and higher higher densities, a better quality. We talk about uh, augmented reality, we talk about virtual reality, we talk about all the different applications in home where we want to connect our home appliances to the internet, into the cloud, to control them, to do sort of predictive analysis so that a toaster could order itself from Amazon when it's about to break so that less interaction by humans is involved. We can use it in cars for the driverless cars in order to get sort of autonomous systems coordinating themselves when they move in, 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 in environments. So we can use street lights to communicate to these uh, autonomous vehicles. We can use it underwater, we can use it in space, so it's, it's really almost limitless where we see the application for it. Now, you've been working on this idea for a really long time. Talk yeah. about how long, because most people think about innovation and they go, they want it to happen <clears> right <throat> away. This is something when you have something this powerful and you're going to change the way we think about things, because we're talking about many, mm. many industries. Yeah. It just doesn't happen overnight. No, it does not. And it's, I've been working on that for 16 years now. Uh, so when I left Siemens, when I wanted to change sort of uh, the tact a little bit. Um, and that, that's why I... Uh, so, I mean, using light as a communication barrier wasn't new. So we have it in our TV remote controls, for example, uses infrared to control the TV set. Uh, there's, there's other people have looked into using white LEDs who came to the market in around 2000, year 2000, to communicate. But that's all low rate. It has been all mm -hmm. sort of very low rate in, in terms of kilobits per second to a device. So what we really wanted to do is to see whether these ordinary devices can transmit extremely high data rates. So that's where sort of our, our out-of-the-box thinking came in to develop modulation techniques, encoding techniques that give us these very high data rates. And that's, that's what we did. And that's what I started when I went to, to academia 16 years ago. I had a student project where we, we thought, okay, what is if we applied that technique, would we be able to get higher data rates? And it was a technique around uh, OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, and it worked. And a student that is a master's student there uh, at, at Jakobs University in Bremen, this is where I started my academic career, it's a Bangladeshi student, came, came to Germany at the age of, I don't know, 18. He did a project, and now he is the CTO of the company I founded in Scotland, uh, Pure Li-Fi. So, uh, I mean, I, I was also blessed to have people working with me and, 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 and buy into that vision of, of changing the world using LED lights, and that's, that's, that's a journey we've taken. So looking at all of that, it, why is it catching on now? Why did it take all these years and you have you know, mm. a student working with you who's now working with you in the company who has this technology vision you do? <clears throat> why did it take so long if it makes just sense that it's going to work? Why, what is that journey it had to be? Yeah, I, I think uh, it, it was, I mean, I, I gave a TED talk in 2011 and it was already sort of eight years to build to that vision. And there hasn't really been the need for it uh, because we had radio. Radio is all, all over the place. We have Wi-Fi at home. We have uh, cellular. We have uh, good communications uh, uh, um, uh, experience with, with that. But now if you go to an airport, if you go to some places, um, sort of the, the wireless data rates and the, the systems don't work. So it's so many people use it for social media for networking for, for the application so that we, we end up in that spectrum crunch. So the radio spectrum is not sufficient to provide all these data connectivities that we need for this you know, fourth industrial revolution we are in. So looking at that, it's really what's happening now with the Internet of Things that you've just described is really making it this exponential connection of devices that we're talking, billions and billions that are connecting to the Internet, that are really is what's pushing mm. Li-Fi to the forefront. That, that's, that's correct. So, I mean, if you look back in the last 10 years, wireless data traffic has increased by a rate of 60% every year. So it's a, it's a, it's a compound annual growth rate of 60%. And if you fast forward 20 years with that rate, and that doesn't include the IoT, sort of the 80, 100 billion devices that come in, just take the sort of human-to-human -human mobile communications in, in terms of uh, YouTube downloads and so on. And that would mean that we would need um, uh, 
12,000 times more bandwidth that we have now today. Now, let's assume we have or take we have 500 megahertz of bandwidth in Wi-Fi, and multiply that by 12,000. You need a bandwidth of six terahertz. The radio spectrum is only 0.3 terahertz, 300 gigahertz. It's a 20 times shortfall of spectrum of the resource that we need in order to drive our nervous system that's underpinning the fourth industrial revolution. It, it's, 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 the, it's the oil equivalent of the second industrial revolution. It, it's, it's the radio spectrum to, to enable all of this, and that is, that is known to be limited. However, the, the visible light spectrum is 2,600 times larger than the radio spectrum. So that 20 times shortfall can easily be compensated by, by the visible light spectrum. And this is why it is taking up at the moment. It is providing that resource, the oil equivalent, to drive the fourth industrial revolution. That's why industry, like the lighting industry, is interested in it. The wireless communications industry is getting interested into it. There's a standardization group now in 802.11, so the, the, the group that standardized Wi-Fi. Industry has formed a Li-Fi um, association. So lots of industries gathered together and try to, to, to market and, and build that, that Li-Fi techno technology. It is, it is spreading very rapidly at the moment because people really recognize that there is an urgent need as we go into this fifth generation of wireless communication. It almost seems like you're forcing some industries to have to change because if no. they don't, mm -hmm. they're going to be left behind. And that's what, mm -hmm. hearing you right now, is what I'm understanding, that if they don't change, they're going to be out of business. It's almost like what we saw with some of what happened in the film industry yeah, and yeah. those kind of things, that yeah. if you don't move, that's the, you're going to be left behind. You're going to be out of business, so bankrupt. What we do, I guess we offer uh, a... a lifeline to the lighting industry in a sense because yes. if you buy an led light bulb it's, if it's a good one it will last 20 and 30 years so the business model is in the lighting industry to sell light bulbs every three months every six months that is gone as the business was gone in the in the in the, in the photography industry with the with the film rolls they weren't sold because of the digital sort of prints so now imagine that you, as a lighting industry, your business model, your fundamental business model is disruptive. It doesn't exist anymore. You have to find new ways and uh, build business around lights. And the, the, the solution is light as a service. So light has now, with our technology, a computer integrated. It has signal processing capability. It has a computer. It has a brain. It has the connectivity to all the things around it in a very secure manner. And it, it, it is allowing, therefore, to run applications. So we talk about the lights that are getting smart and run applications to drive the Internet of Things. It's ideal because lights are everywhere, and, and we want to, to connect all the things around us which are seeing the light, basically, in, in all the rooms. So it's an ideal barrier, barrier to use that to then drive applications in, sitting in the light. So, the, the smartphone equivalent, the smartphone has was a, was a, a mini-computer, but what really made it a success was it being opened up to many application developers. And this, this ecosystem of, of application developers has driven sort of the, the mobile and the, the smartphone industries. Now imagine you have similar application developers that develop applications for your lights. And then it's an entirely new business model that the And that's what we're going to see. That's, we're going to see new applications yeah. coming out of this. Are we seeing mm. those already? Oh, we, have, we are seeing that already. So we have lights are being used for indoor navigation, for, for, for smart uh, sort of indoor asset management. And that's the first sort of the beachhead applications we see. But this is only the start. We will see high rate applications, AR, VR applications, high definition video transmission from the light. And, and so on. Yeah, that's, that's the start. That's the journey we've started. And, and this is a disruption that the industry will 
see, but also a huge opportunity to run into business models, new business models. Well, let's make a transition to that because that's important because you serve two roles. You serve a role as a professor, yeah. but you serve the role as, I think, as chief strategy officer of Pure Li-Fi, the company that you started to yeah. actually support your Li-Fi. And yeah. in that way, you're actually cultivating these new generation of innovators to come up with ideas and understand what's going to happen in mm. Li-Fi. Yeah. Talk about motivating those new students and also supporting solutions behind Pure Li-Fi. Talk about that. Yeah, I think it, it's very important that, I see it very important to have this dual functionality. So I'm the chief uh, scientific officer of, of Pure Li-Fi and uh, trying to make sure that the, uh, the, the scientific direction of the company is right, that we get innovation integrated as, as we go along. But at the same time, what we need is new talent because there is no base of, of sort of trained engineers and, and trained science, scientists in that field of Li-Fi or light communication. There's lots of radio engineers around, but the, the, the fundamental principles of encoding data in light are different. They're, they're similar, but, but there's subtle differences. So we need to build that base of talent. Uh, and that's why I, my educational role comes in. I'm educating uh, PhD students, master students, undergraduate students who come from all over the world have seen my TED Talks and I get the emails and say, you know, can, I, can I join you in, in that journey of life? And I um, take as much as I can in terms of people getting them in and, and trying to give them an opportunity to, to innovate in that space. And that, that is so important that we drive the, the ecosystem also around the talent, not also not on, on, the, on the industry front. And that's, that's, that's my second role. How do you find that right individual who you can kind of mold and shape to understand because if they want to come, you have to limit who you can take. But understanding what Li-Fi really is and how they can yeah. stay motivated and understand because they're going to have stumbles, they're going to fall, and they're not going to have the right solution. Uh, I mean, we, we have, uh, we have an, a worldwide reach, and that's, that's I'm very delighted. So we get people from all over the place, from China, from India, from America, from Germany, all of the place coming and, and we have the therefore the luxury to find and, and select the best people in that space and, and they've given challenges and they are not giving solutions they are given challenges and you can easily f quickly find out who will come up with with the, with the smart solutions and I'm, I'm, I'm so delighted all my students are extremely extremely smart and they really they really are the basis to to to, to that innovation I, I would be impossible for me with all the travels to innovate at, at that rate we are innovating at the moment. And that's because of the students and the talent that is around there. Is that tough trying to be an innovator and trying to, f you know, because you face a lot of daily challenges. How, how, how do you manage that? Uh, I think uh, well, I, I develop my space. <laughs> so I, that's, that's why I, I, although I'm sometimes in the middle of, of crowds and conferences, but I have my spaces where I go out hiking. That's why we selected to go back to Scotland, because it, it opens up such a big free space of you can be on your own for an entire day. And then these spaces is, is something that, that I really appreciate to think about problems, think about how we can move directions. And then I have the initial thoughts that I would discuss with my students. And then we take different directions, test them, see if it works, and then fail fast, move on to the next. So that's, that's the way I, I operate. Do you teach your students to think the same way that, you know, that if you're going to stumble, it's okay. Making a mistake and is, is okay, and you need to do that. You need to take a break, get out there, relax, yeah. and come back in, and that's okay because we're going to fail, and it's, failure's fine. Uh, what I tell my students always, the worst you can do is take a, a paper of a sort of a colleague, which it's good. We need to do that to understand what others are doing. But don't repeat what they've done and change one or two or three parameters. Don't do marginal research. Go out, take and digest what that means, and think how you could take that forward into a, into a more radical new way, also by combining different, different ideas and different approaches to something that's new. And, um, I always encourage my students to think out of the box and come up with a, with a stupid idea. I mean, not really, but to try to be innova innovative and, and, and test the idea, idea. And we will find out whether it works or it doesn't. And in, in, in the 90% of the cases, sort of radically new ideas fail because they are not, 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 not feasible. But 10% of the cases, they lead to something that is radically new. And that's what we need. 
And that's how, how, how biology, how human uh, sort of evolution of the planet worked, is, is via trying out mutations, trying out different things, and then the, the, best, the best will survive. And, and that's, that's, that's needed in, so in science as well. Do you see yourself as a role model then? I don't want to be seen as a role model. I, I have a certain approach, and I, 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 I have my approach, and others might be valid as well, but I, I want to innovate. I want to be, drive innovation. I want to be different, different from the mainstream, and that, that is what, what has been driving me. And are there certain traits that you want to instill in your students so they carry those on to the next person that they encourage or motivate? Yeah, it's really that, that out of out of the box thinking, the the the, uh, the, the, the ability and the, the courage and the the hunger to try new go new paths, like going to jungle where there is no path at all, and you don't know where you would go. You just know there is some lot of excitement around all these trees and leaves and so on, but then have the courage to to take whatever it needs in order to walk through that 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 jungle and, and find out what's behind the stone, what's under the stone, what's under the leaf, and make sense and, and try, try to understand and build, build, build upon that. As an engineer, we need to take that knowledge in order to build systems to, to aid and help mankind. Did that influence come from your readings of Henry David Thoreau? Is that why you feel like that today, that you like that outside, you like thinking you've got to think outside the box, those kind of things, those influences? I, I think, yeah, that, that is a, you mentioned Henry David Thoreau. He, he has been inspiring me in my younger years, which is sadly a long <laughs> time back now. Uh, he was a very inspirational sort of transcendentalist. Also Emerson, they, they inspired me because they, they thought, they looked at the world and, and basically t turned it upside down and saw what happened. Uh, Thoreau said, let's have two days of working week and five days of uh, weekend. <laughs> and, and this kind of thinking is, is so important. Um, and he, he went out, he went to, to, to Walden, he had his pond, he was thinking. That, that, that kind of culture inspired me. That's what I uh, saw. Did, so uh, did that outdoors kind of feeling come as a part of that? You thought that, you know, because that's what he liked. He felt you had to be outdoor, you have to be a minimalist in some ways. And, but, you know, in some of that today, you like the outdoors, you like hiking, you, and you could spend three weeks. I think you said you had a canoe trip you were out there for three weeks. We and went th three weeks without seeing anyone uh, <laughs> through, 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 through Canada, yes. I think that's, that's so um, rewarding, and uh, it, it, it tells you the, the essential things of life. And, and another experience in my life is that I really appreciate this. After my studies in Germany, I grew up in a very secure Bavarian um, uh, village. But I got a scholarship from Heinz Nixdorf to spend a year in India, and that completely changed my view of the world, where I saw a value system which was different from the value system I was working in. And I thought... In what way? In a, in a way that you have to work hard at school, you have to do certain things in order to be successful in your society. And then I went to India, and I saw these children that were playing on the beaches with a... With a, with a a ring of wood and a, and a stick, and they, they were happy. I saw that spirit, spirituality made people happy, not goods. So thinking, living in their world, and living in their very spirit, spiritual world and being happy. And that, I mean, it's a simple thing, but, but seeing that every day for a year and seeing the different culture made me realize, okay, the world is more than... A Bavarian village. It, it's 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 wide, and I I, I try to um, take that as a as, as a as an encouragement to, uh, um, to 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 be different and 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 and, and use the creativity to, to help. So does that things. help you think then how important innovation is when you see something like that and you take it today and you go, innovation can really change lives in so many different ways, and you have to work hard in order to do that. That that, that is that is absolutely correct. Um, uh, the the uh, the. Uh, seeing the essential things, but also seeing that we can use technology to help build better systems and better, a better world that make us live longer, be more secure. But, but being driven by, by, by that motive is, is, is very, very important. So if you look now in your life and you say everything, you, you serve kind of multiple roles. You serve, you know, as a professor, you serve as a businessman, you serve as a father, a husband. How do you juggle it all? How do you make all that work? Uh, it, is, it is a very challenging task. Um, 
and uh, the ones that I often regret suffer most are my family. Uh, they probably don't while, like while hearing I'm that. While I'm sitting here, I know my son has been selected for a math competition. I, I wanted to hug him <laughs> regardless oh, of whether, right? whether, whether you want or not. That's what I will do that when I go back. But, but it's, it's so important, but it's also uh, very good to see that, for example, my son is the biggest ambassador of LIFI in his school. Every teacher in the school knows about LIFI, and he's proud of that. And seeing the children being proud of what we, we do basically stimulates me to do even more. So I try to, to, make, to combine that in, all in, in a very sensible way. Yeah. So looking at all that, when you think about the things, your family, you have four children and you have young children. I think we talked about you have a three-year-old, a six-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 13-year-old. That's I have those, right? That's correct. So you, you have to kind of constantly, you know, constantly get back there and try to do as much as you can for enjoyment, to spend time with those. It's outdoors, <clears throat> a lot of outdoor things you get to do. Yeah. I did, yeah, and I, I take every minute that I have with a family to, to make it as valuable as possible. I, I spend, for example, in Scotland, it's a, it's a big lake, uh, Loch Lomond is, is called. It has many islands. So I, I took that uh, folding canoe that we used to go through Canada and took my son in the, in the summer last, last week, uh, last year, uh, on, a, on a trip, on a boat trip through the islands. And he said it was the best day he had ever had because we spent very big, valuable time with almost nothing, just sitting there on our, or lying there on our mats, thinking about the world and then and, and shipping around. It was, was good. And then, uh, Kids enjoy that, and that's, that's what I try to do, so get, get these spaces, yeah. So you look at this, you have your family, your wife and your kids, and you think that you're changing the world in a, a, in a special way. Is that then important when you and your wife talk about that you're making these sacrifices? Is that why it's so important? Because you're really doing something, you're leaving something special for your family. And I, I'm very blessed to have a family who supports my vision and my sort of desire to innovate and do new things and uh, drive worlds. So it would not be possible without, without that understanding and support. Um, so, I'll, but I hope that at one point, one time, one point in life, uh, I'll, I'll give back to the family what they've given me, you know, in, in terms of space and developing that, yeah. So let's think about this. If you could wish you could do something over, besides just looking at that, is there anything you would do over? No. That's awesome. I so that's what so. you gotta feel good about, right? You feel like you're doing it all right. Is if, you're, you've changed things like this. What if you could be remembered for one thing? What do you want to be remembered for? You are the father of Li-Fi, so you're going to be remembered for that. So uh, I want to be remembered in my kids to be a father who has inspired them to do their own thing. That's what I want to be rem remembered for. Well, I have to tell you, I have enjoyed this. Thank Harold, you. thank you for coming and spending time with us. And enjoying a, a nice Bavarian beer. Thank, Thank you. you. There you go. And there you have it. Our Thanks. time with Harold Haas. Thank you.